All right. We're going to call this Design Intent for Dummies. I don't know if you've ever seen these Dummy for Dummies books, if they even still exist. But we're going to kind of go into Design Intent for Dummies because we got a lot of um, new uh, up and coming engineers. And this is something that, uh, as, a, as a mentor for uh, interns and co ops and stuff, and, and uh, Altech industry. This is something that we always have to stress with the new hires and things. So I figured we could do a, a presentation on on a design intent topic, and I think this would be beneficial for everyone. So it's going to, this is be targeted for entry level users and students and um, middle school, high school, college age. So, um, but yeah, my name is uh, Tank or Brad Metter. Um, I'm a nine year uh, project designer at Altech Industries, a 15 year SolidWorks user, and I got my CSWE in 2018. Um, I'm a husband, dad, motorcycle minister, and to top it all off, while I'm not doing anything with any of my free time, I figured I might as well go ahead and add electrical engineering as well and go back to college for a four-year degree myself. So in the abundance of free time, why not just fill it full of everything, especially Calc 3? I don't know if anybody's done that yet. Calc 3? I'm on my third go-around on Calc 3, so... Yeah, I'm not good at it. I'm terrible. Huh? Keep fighting the good fight. That's right. All right. So, design intent, right? How to get the parts you think you need. So, we're going to kind of go over the definition. I actually looked it up. Um, the definition of design intent plus the SOLIDWORKS definition of design intent, which is a little bit different. Um, how to convey it. We're going to go over some examples some what's to do's, what nots to do's, and learn from my mistakes, because I've actually got some of my mistakes in here from past years of um, being a young gun in, in CAD design. So it'll be a little bit of um, don't follow, do as I say, not do as I used to do. So let me go get my stopwatch here going up so I can make sure I don't go over on time. All right, so can anybody tell me what design intent is? It could be layman's terms. It could be the professional term. Can anybody tell me? I mean, it's what you want out of a product, right? It's what you, it's, it's getting your, it's getting what you design in your hand, right? Um, the technical term is a detailed technical description of the part criteria design defined by the designer engineer. So exactly what you intended is what comes out, right? Well, in SOLIDWORKS, we like to say it, it should, it's how the model should change, or how it should behave when it's changed. So basically, how, how do you set part files up? How do you set your models up, your assemblies? And how do you get the product you want by doing that? And so this is something that, you know, evolves over time depending on if you're in the prototyping phase or if you're in the production phase, so a little bit, so your parts and stuff might morph over time. Um, how many people are actually in like senior design projects and stuff at campus or on like a prototyping team or anything? I got one, I got a couple, two, uh, a, little, a little half. Okay. So if you, if you start doing these prototyping things and you're going in and rapidly changing models, by the time you get to your final product, it'll be a little different and you'll have to kind of change the way you design or you, what, the way you model it to get the design intent you want, especially if you want to throw a drawing out there for somebody to manufacture. Now, are you guys manufacturing stuff on campus? Are you, are you manufacturing stuff here on campus or are you like outsourcing it to other places? Little Fab, okay. Do you have out external sources as well? Okay, you buy, okay. Do you send them drawing packages and things or are you just doing? Okay. 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 All right. So let's move on. So we'll jump over to the CAD mobile. Yes, I have like 15 models open. That's just for simplicity. All right. So we'll kind of go back over here. I'm doing a sheet metal piece of a plate. I actually have it as, as modeled as the sheet metal part. We have this thing set up um, to be two by 12. 
and it is half inch thick, okay? But I have some tap tools in here, all right? Now, you might think this is an extremely simple part, right? Well, if I go in and start changing dimensions of this base flange, we'll just go over here and go to 16 inch, 16 inches instead of 12. Did I intend for those four holes in the middle to move? Was that my intent of the design? It could be. No, actually it was, but I'm just, after, I'm just saying like, this is, this is a good example of, you know, even the simplest little changes can go in and um, change your design overall or have the intended, the intended effect. So we kind of, we kind of, um, at least at Altec, we have a very top down approach. We have a, you know, a basic idea and then we drill down into what we want. So we do a lot of um, design as we go. So this comes up a lot. You change one dimension on one part and the entire assembly gets blown up. And it's because we've, we've set ourselves up for failure with, you know, unnecessary dimensions or dimensions in the wrong spot based on the design intent that we have of, in this part. So in the model here for this tapped hole, you see I've got them dimensioned where I, I want them two inches apart and two inches from the end. Now that is precisely what I needed specifically for this design. But if I didn't, I would actually have to go back through, update the model itself and change. Oh, Adam, I forgot your stuff's all backwards. Change your dimensions. I know, I know. To get the reflected design intent that I needed. Just changing things. So now I've got, you know, something that gets bolted to this panel and I can come back through and change this dimension, any, the outside dimension anywhere I need to. And now the holes don't move. That's the design intent kind of playing around with that. Um, you know, a lot of new hires or people are just, you know, getting rushing. They just start throwing dimensions and get it fully defined. And that might not get the constant, the, they might have, end up with unintended consequences. So I'm very big on when you start figuring out where you want things to go, locking them down with the dimensions that you need to based on the intent of what you're trying to create. So this is um, very easy, uh, a thing to look over, you know, your constraints might be wrong, your dimensions might be in the wrong spots. Will the part come out the right way? Yeah, but the next time somebody else down the line can come through and change it, it might mess up the entire model. So it's always good to, to kind of base your design intent on each individual part as you go. Um, another big thing, little pro tip, is if you're doing SolidWorks design or any CAD software, name your features on the side. See all this stuff here on, the, on your feature tree, it kind of has generic descriptions now. Well, 10 years down the line, I might have somebody come in and go, okay, what was this tapped hole for? Well, we can come in, change your feature property, update the thing to say like um, mounting holes. And now, every time somebody opens this part up, they know that that feature there is the mounting holes for this wear pad that I'm gonna use in this assembly or in this weldment or whatever bolting unit I have. So that also will help convey your design intent. Naming, naming your features as you'd model them, um, dimensioning them appropriately, and then uh, moving on into, um, into the next phase of your design. Also, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to throw them at me. I like to work and like back and forth, so you don't have to wait till the end if you want questions. So just feel free. We have somebody monitoring our chat. If anybody on the live stream is watching, if they have questions, we can do that as well. So now we've got the design intent of this part laid out, right? How are we going to convey it to the machine shop? How many people actually work currently with machine shops, design parts? Okay, we got a couple. All right. How would you go about dimensioning this to get the, the design intent? Because there's probably 50 different ways I could dimension this and get specific 
things, but every outcome will be just a tad different. How would you go about designing it if you know that this is? Yes, that is a good one. Yes, yeah, so you can go into your insert model items and come down here, pick your dimensions, hit the check mark. And there's your, there's some of your model dimensions there. It'll, I have to actually go in and turn those back on, I believe. Do you have yours turned off, Adam? Your model dimensions? Okay. But yes, you can do that as well. You can actually use the model dimensions. But let's say, you know, we don't have a, we have a guy who's not familiar with doing that. Um, do you measure off everything off the center plane? Do you measure off end to end? Do we off an end in a corner? Yes. Appropriate. You None. bring it in like an ordinate dimension, so you have a zero zero axis to work at that point. He was asking where they usually start and end their dimensions and how they, they progress their dimensions into the drawing. And he mentioned that he uses he starts at a corner, and I'm assuming the lower left hand corner is what we Yep. But, so you start the dimensions at a, at a point in the drawing and you either progress or digress in your dimensions if you can positive or negative in either way. Um, and that allows, it's basically, it's a good CNC function. Anything you're using, whether it's a, a punch, a laser, a plasma, CNC, five axis, whatever you're using, at that point, it's using a coordinate system already. So you use ordinate dimensions to kind of help mm -hmm. you grow from your zero, zero, just like any other graph to where you need to be at that point for a whole here yes to avoid an accidental tolerance stack yes so you put dimensions like referencing each other you can end up with like double tolerance yeah yes so you can you can you can stack dimensions if you have an intent that's part of design intent. but if you don't want that intent in there like marty was just saying if you don't do a zero zero off ordinate dimension at least pull all your dimensions from that same point of reference so yeah if you put say one inch from the edge to this hole, and then one inch from that hole to the next hole. If you have a 16 inch tolerance on each dimension, you can grow by, by you know, an eighth inch by your second hole. Yes. So up on the screen, I'm, I'm kind of doing that as well, just kind of. Now, these dimensions on the bottom and these dimensions on the top technically are the same. Um, they will get you the desired outcome. The holes are dimensioned and they're in the right spots. But like, like Adam said, when you start looking at your tolerance blocks, so if you look like a, at Altex specific tolerance block, we build giant parts, sometimes that are 40, 50 foot long. So we have a 16th of an inch tolerance yeah, we all on those, on those, on each dimension. So if you chain, chain dimensions off parts, this hole here could be plus or minus an eighth of an inch off. So based on, you know, what you're intending on your, on your product, um, the dimensioning, could be affected as well. Um, the same thing with GDNT. I don't know if uh, anybody taken a GDNT class or done any training, formal training on GDNT. Geometric Does anybody know what that is? Okay, I know a couple. All right. Yeah, because in that top one you've been talking about, you got two and a half, two inches, right? So that second hole could honestly be anywhere from yep. um, plus four and, four and three eighths all the way up to four and five eighths. Yep. Right. You have that tolerance stack of 16 between two holes. Yes. Also, when you're when you're trying to convey design, if I don't need these holes to be that tight, I don't need to throw the GDNT in. I don't know if you've, if you've seen a print that's got GDNT on everything. You've got datums on one view and your your references on the other. You know, try to convey it with the three C's of a drawing: Cons clear, concise, and complete. If it does it need 75 dimensions and datum tolerances and then don't, you know, try to convey it as simple as possible with the least amount of, of um, work. Cause it can be confusing to somebody out on the floor who's made machining it. You could, yes. According to dimensioning system, if you were planning on using a, um, like a CNC uh, laser or, a, you know, a hole punch, that would be the, the yes. Now, if, if I was coming in here and I was going to cut that by hand, then I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. I would actually lay it out kind of similar to this right here at the bottom. Yeah, whole table. Yes. Whole tables can help out. Yeah, whole tables can help out with that too. So if you locate a whole table and you call out different holes being certain designators like A, B, C, or whatever, mm -hmm. and you get those coordinate systems for each one. Yep, you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. So just just one simple 
one simple example uh, of some design intent that you can um, do. Um, so we're going to kind of look at these uh, modeling specific uh, design intent. Um, so we've got two two blocks here, right? They look identical, correct? They were made two completely different ways. They both get the same outcome, um, but the number of features in each one are different. So I've called, I've labeled this one good design intent. So I've got everything labeled appropriately and laid out appropriately. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten features in this entire part, right? Modeled based on what I think I need to get the design intent. Um, I actually modeled this off of a, a previous uh, experience of, we'll just go ahead and open this up and kind of show you what happens as we roll this back. Somebody um, started with a part and said, oh, I need it thicker. So I want to add another extrude on top of that, make it thicker. Well, I'm going to cut a hole in it but I don't want that hole all the way. So I'm gonna add another extrude. We're gonna put a fillet in, we're gonna drop another fillet in, we're gonna drop another cut in, another fillet, another cut. He, the person at the time was just going as fast as they could to get it done without actually thinking, how would this be to edit later? So this, I mean, it can it conveys the design correctly. It, the part works, but for somebody like me, it's come back later, 10 years, 20 years down the line, Having to modify, let's say if I wanted to modify this cutout here, I don't know where it's gonna be. It's not called out, it's not labeled properly, and about 90% of the time, it's underdefined. Does anybody know how to tell if the part's underdefined inside of SolidWorks? There's a little, there's a little thing that pops up. Can you tell? I'll, I'll show you, we'll underdefine this sketch. Do you see it? That little minus sign tells you that that part is underdefined. Also, you come down to the bottom of the screen, there's a little area down here. I can't see it because of my zoom controls. Yes, it'll actually tell you at the bottom, fully defined and underdefined, but my zoom controls are blocking all that now. It'll actually tell you at the bottom. So again, I could be coming in here you know, the design is, it's there. The intent is there, but it was hard to modify later. So it's something to add a little bit of uh, thought in when you're, when you're going in through and you're creating things um, to be made later. So we go back into this uh, assembly. You see, I come back in and open up this, we'll call this one the good one. I know where everything's at. I know which still it goes where. If I need to change the pocket size, I know exactly where the side pocket is. I know exactly all the sides that are there. Everything's fully defined. I can come in and change what I need and it's just all ready to go. It conveys my thoughts on the design and it gets, gets the product to me as intended. So we'll go ahead and start closing these out so Adam can not have hundreds of these open. Thank you, Jeff. I'm trying to be considerate here. <laughs> All right. Now, let's go back. So, same can be said, say if you have a round part. We've got this part here, all the dimensions are shown, just kind of give you an idea. I don't know if you notice anything. There's not one starting datum point for this part to be made. So if you're going to be ma making this on a lathe, you're going to want to have a start position to start your dimensions off of. Now, the machinists can get this made, but they're going to have to sit out there, do some math, pull out a ruler, pull out a calculator, mark the part. It just makes it a lot slower for them to manufacture the part. So, Based on what you're saying, I wouldn't think I would want to pull the pull the uh, model dimensions from this, correct? So I would probably start from one end and dimension everything off that off that spot. So we go in and just start 
laying our dimensions out from one datum. Now, in, in your course of work, do you guys use the ordinate dimensions or do you do the baseline with all of them go straight across? You do both based on, I guess, machining top specifics? Would you say? True. Now, on sheet metal parts that are solely laser cut, do you guys leave them under dimensioned at all? Okay. Now, just so you know, uh, the ASME Y14 now has a subsection in there for under for non-dimensioned parts because everything later is controlled off of DXF. You don't necessarily need to show every dimension on that part. We had to go so so I, I worked for a company prior to Alte. Did, did I just pick a sore scab? Well, it's it's in this. It, I'm just letting you know it's there now on the newer ones. So if you guys were to do it, or if you were going to like SolidWorks NBD to model based design, it gives you a little bit more flexibility, so you can get those drawings out faster. Yeah, there, there needs to be a little preference to what that's being said too. So I worked for a company prior to Altec many years ago, where I kind of started an initiative with the same thing, right? And it, it comes from a mindset of custom made parts, right? Um, design from order, right? So when somebody orders something, you grab it, design, you design it when they order, right? But it's always custom. Now, if you're designing, say, a Samsung phone or a Toyota Corolla, right? Of course, you're going to put GDT in there. You're going to, you're going to define those dimensions on every print. But you're recreating those parts how many times a day? Millions, millions right? of times. So you do need a quality control process. Yes. I'm not saying custom uh inventory or custom design material doesn't need quality control because it does but it just needs a different type of quality correct so when you have custom things coming through the shop every day you're not going to dimension or you're not going to measure every part especially if you have sheet metal for example when you have something that's unfolded and flat you put holes in it then you fold it when are you ever going to be able to find that dimension from the flat pattern to the bit part right yes we have shops that we deal with go they scan even if we send them a drawing they redraw it Yes, yeah, exactly. That happens all the time. That's you send them true. a send them a flat pattern. They'll take that flat pattern, draw it out, and then fold it themselves on on, on their machines, right? I mean, on their CAD software. And, and that's a great point too. So if you're just if you're consuming the information in house, you can set up SolidWorks where you don't even use drawing, right? Model based definition. You don't even use drawing. Yes. Everything is located within the model. All that information, all those holes, all those fillets. Everything's in the in the model and it's dimensioned there and it's consumed by CNC machines, right? So when you push that information out, the machine green. Yes. Not a person. Yep. Right? Uh, so there's a lot of information, a lot of ifs, ands, and buts on why we would do this and that. And now if you're not consuming the information yourself, then maybe you do need to add the dimensions because the person you're sending it to in Taiwan or China or California, whatever, they need to understand it. And that's of course where GD and D also come in. Yes. So, so you can have design tables and, and you may be talking about configurations, maybe different parts within that. Um, same thing, just a little bit modification to each each part. So you can definitely have that, but yeah, they're gonna read that. And if they if if your product calls for quality checks at certain points, then yeah, they're gonna use those tables to check them. Yes. If you're just spitting the information out and the machine can read the information. Even on sheet metal, you could say up bend is, you know, a phantom purple and a down bend is a hidden green, right? And then the machines can actually read that information. You have an air bend. We talked about yeah. this a couple of nights ago, that the air bend machine can actually read it. You don't even need it. But yeah. There's a lot of a lot of manufacturing processes now that don't even have human hands in them until at the end, the inspection site. So but just kind of going into that. Um, so you in 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 this machining part here i could send it out to the machine shop without a drawing but do you think it would be convoluted for them to try to read they could actually get an S, like a stl file for 3d printing or um was it an sat file i think for press breaks and stuff but all these dimensions in there are going to be you know all over the place so you know that's kind of where um the intent comes from is how are you intending it to, how are you intending to measure it? How are you intending it to inspect it? And that's where we, 
where we see all these dimensions. Sometimes your inspection process, process really, does it work? Does it fit? Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, does it fit? A, a lot of our parts, you know, 40 feet long and they're cut out of 12 gauge steel. So it's kind of like, it's, yeah. Can I hit it with a hammer and bend it back in? Yeah, that's fine. I've been in places where five decimal places is the tolerance. And then, you know, you're sitting there measuring it with a, a cam, a CMM or a, a ferro arm, and you're rejecting something for being one tenth thou out of place. And then the so, design standard team at our place argues between two and three decimal places. Yes. And then, you know, we have a group of individuals that like to argue between two and three. Now, <laughs> as you can see here, this is a little overkill. I don't need eight decimal points on this part, but if I needed to, I could actually set those up later um, for each dimension that I want to have them inspect from. So, oh, my camera went off. It's like right at 30 minutes. Ah, okay. So, um, so we went, we're going to go through, so we make sure we stay on time. Tell you what, we'll just open it to Q, general Q&A on this one so we can get, get back on track. And that way Adam can get his started at seven. So we'll do general Q&A about SOLIDWORKS or about design. Um, we got, I don't know, five minutes or so to do kind of open Q&A, stump the chump, and we'll go um, get Adam's stuff set up for his seven o'clock start time. Yeah, Tank likes to stump the chumps. If you got any questions, yes. anything you're working on now or you're getting ready to work on, have any questions about them, feel free to ask. That had some great questions so far. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned you put the approaches that you say as well. Yes. The same see what you for the first time, what you was in the direction of how long you would see the design. Like, how long you would see the next room, second one would be the pocket. Yes. I would I would think of it because I've got a little bit of a machining background. I would think of the steps it would take to machine it. So I know that that piece of aluminum or steel will come from a bigger block. So you would set your set your block size and then do your big major cuts and then do uh, your you know your rough your rough passes and then your final passes. So things like your fillets and your finish chamfers and things will be at the very bottom of the tree. Uh, because those are just final passes and just clean up touch up stuff and that's just kind of how i uh, how i've approached things because I, i've done i've got my hands in into the machining world and that's how you you, you kind of start you go rough and then finer detail i would do the same thing i would start start with the major shape first and then work down into the finer details you always want your, and we, we talked about this, and that's a great question, because we talked about fillets being at the end already a little bit before. Um, yes. The last couple of meetings. But you always want your features to complement each other, right? Yes. You don't want one feature built off another feature where it has to go back and recalculate back to the first feature, right? Because then you're going to get circular references. You're going to cause a slowdown in the, okay. in the part rebuild times. Um, as you mentioned, you know, fillets at the end are great because so you, you need to simplify the part and have a, a time savings on a higher top level assembly. We well, can come back and simplify the part just by removing fillets. Yes. If you have fillets up in the feature tree higher, you can ruin your mop. Yep. Bon bonus point. SolidWorks builds from top of the tree to the bottom of the tree. So it, it calculates every step one at a time. So the more things you add in your feature tree, obviously the longer it takes to calculate. So if you go in and you're going to stick, let's say this, this uh, cap here, onto a, 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 a sub-assembly, which is five assemblies deep into a ma big major water plant, right? I don't need to see this chamfer or this fillet. I can actually suppress those, but notice they're in the wrong spots. If I would have based another feature off of that, those would have all blown up as well. Or suppressed. Or suppressed themselves, yeah. You say those holes were afterwards and they were linked to the, the edge of the fillet edge for some reason. You could have deleted the yeah. whole process. Yes. Hold in the process. Yeah. So that's that kind of uh, that kind of process uh, as well. We've the biggest issue we find with people crashing SolidWorks is usually user caused pain by I wouldn't say modeling incorrectly, but at, inadvertently creating circular references, like things like mating to a patterned part or mirroring to a mating to a mirrored part 
it actually causes the software to go back through and re recalculate all the way down to the bottom to the mates to the and it just keeps going yeah i remember i remember when i was back in college i had a professor and i'll never forget it i had a professor i'd say professor i've got an issue and he said well the problem lies between the keyboard and the chair yes and if that doesn't fix it it's like general real <laughs> yeah so you know this adding i think those little model touches like that as you're going along will help a convey the design intent to your machine shop but also to the next person in line who's going to modify your part because we've uh, the company that we're at has been around almost 100 years and we have prints that are from the 1930s and 40s that were you know converted from sketches actual sketch paper into autocad in the sometime in the 80s and then now it's converted back to solid converted into solid works and you know we're trying to you know keep those alive by you know properly modeling them and also so, I know what thank you kind of mentioned a little earlier and standing out the answer to that question is the first one he showed had all these different all these different features and some were redundant features versus the second one was more simplified the more features you have the longer it's going to take to rebuild right so you want to simplify your your solution into and as mix as few features as possible correct it's not always the answer but it's going to definitely give you a better, better yes way to go. correct good question i like your question good any more so far we got about two minutes before we need to start switching over to adam so all right so uh the torch has been passed all right <laughs> so my presentation is going to be about envelopes um and i like to call it you know the envelopes are not just for sending letters myself personally as i told you earlier when i first came in my name is adam ebernickel i'm a senior designer uh, with product engineering at Altec industries uh with brad as well brad's at a different location he's at a roanoke virginia location i'm at the burnsville location which is just a little bit north of Asheville. uh we do what you'd call normal utility trucks bucket trucks digger derricks uh line pools it's a lot of different ones backyard derricks a lot of different stuff of that nature that we work on and deal with um i do more at the body plant is our location um in the process of working there, I also adjunct at, in the Applied Engineering Department at Mayland Community College. I really enjoy that. I started doing that probably shortly after I started Altec, almost 10 years ago. Probably been at the college for eight or nine years now. Actually, it was a funny coincidence. I was out eating with a colleague of mine. We had printing stuff we were checking out at the college, and the the main guy over that that department was really inundated and swarmed with everything that was going on. He was a one man band trying to get the, the whole curriculum up and running. And he just, you could tell he swarmed. I told him, I said, dude, if you need any help, let me know. It was a couple of days later, he emailed me and said, you sure about helping? I was like, yeah. He said, well, I need you. So been helping him out ever since. It's been a lot of fun. I really enjoy giving back in that nature. Just no more than I do giving back in the SWUG community too for SolidWorks user groups. So I do co-lead the Western North Carolina Asheville user group. I'm also the, the swugging committee member for the whole Southeast region. So all the groups in the Southeast, uh, I work with all those groups. Uh, we recently, over the last six months or so, started really putting a voice to our company, Altec, and making swug groups within that. The swug groups there, we've, we've opened up at different locations. We actually kicked this whole Iron Swug event off in, in Birmingham at that location. That was the second group that came on board. We've, we're up to almost, five six groups now so i'm also a committee member for all the altex well groups too like brad i'm a solidworks champion and a certified solidworks expert a lot of fun going through those certifications if you haven't ventured into any of them or looked at any of them i would definitely advise you to do that get the cswa then go to the cswp of course you have to have four out of the five advanced to get to the e but do that it's it's definitely beneficial and it'll broaden your horizon I know once we, we get into our engineering field, we kind of pigeonhole ourselves into what we're doing at that moment. But what these certifications really do is help us broaden our mind across all of SolidWorks, not only make us a great employee, but also a good advocate of SolidWorks and, and helping other people too. So it's definitely a, a good thing to work with. So some key takeaways with this presentation is what is an envelope, right? Do we just stick a stamp on it and put it in the mailbox? Well, probably not in a SolidWorks case. So we're gonna talk about that. When and how and why would I even use an envelope in SolidWorks? And some of the, the settings and some tips that are involved with envelopes, right? So this is not 
going to be uh, as much as the design intent as what Brad did, but it really does carry into what Brad was talking about with design intent because it will help not only yourself, but your supplier, uh, your customer. Your customer could be your external customer or internal customer. If you guys are familiar with that, you got your external customer who's probably purchasing the product. Your internal customer is the person consuming the information after you, you develop it, right? So somebody in the shop floor, which we call DFM, Design for Manufacturing. We always got to look out for those guys because that's where the rubber meets the road. But yeah, what is an envelope? It is a special kind of part or assembly. Now, when you look at a few criteria of that, when I talk about special part of it or assembly, what about the mass? It doesn't have any mass, right? So the mass is negligible when you talk about adding an envelope into your model and needing to know the mass for what you're actually designing, right? What about the bill of material, the bomb, right? The bill of material does not affect your overall construction of your design in association with the envelope. It's more like a reference, right? It's more like a reference part that we're putting in there just for a general idea or concept to build something around, right? Uh, it can be temporary, temporary. It can be in there permanently, and it can be in a, you know, your parts or your assemblies, right? You can, you can develop and, and put them in how you want. So I like to call it a ghost part, right? When we talk about Casper, and if Casper's a friendly ghost, I would say envelopes are friendly ghosts, right? They really can help benefit our process. Besides it having ghost-like capabilities, it does the following. You can mate it to other parts and mate parts to it. The mass of the envelope will not count towards the assembly mass, as we just stated. SolidWorks also shows the envelope part as a blue or translucent uh, type feature. Um, you, you can also do opaque. So there's a lot of different things. We'll talk about that in the settings. Also in the feature tree, it gives a, a different designator to it as well. So if you look in the feature tree, the icon in the feature tree gets a little envelope kind of icon next to it, right? And that's for the part. Or if it's a sub-assembly, you can see how that actually changes. No different than when we look at a part, it kind of looks like a little Tetris block, right? And then when we have an assembly, it has a Tetris block with a little cube on it, right? And so that's what we're seeing it here between a part and a sub-assembly of an envelope. But it also has it kind of in an envelope. So that's how we know what they are. Uh, the envelope does not show in your drawing views by default. So you have to turn those on. And we'll talk about that to be able to show it. And you don't have to show it. Maybe you don't want to show it, right? It's totally up to you. That's up to your design intent and how you want that information to be consumed. Um, the checkbox exclude from bill of materials. We'll look at that when we get into the settings. It does get checked off automatically and it is grayed out and cannot be turned back on. Um, this means the envelope will never appear in your bomb, in your bill of materials, right? This is why working with envelopes is, is way better than copying parts into multiple assemblies and then suppressing or deleting them when the design is done. So when you're ins inserting or converting an envelope, uh, you'll notice as, as you get the insertion dialog box, get my mouse over here, this is actually when you do the insertion, and this is when you have to convert. And I'll actually go through that process here in just a moment and kind of show that to you. You can also, it's a new feature they added probably, what try to make guys, probably a couple of years ago, they added the publish envelope feature, I think within the last few iterations. So that's a pretty neat feature too, to be able to take it from your main assembly, publish it into another assembly and utilize it there. Um, where can that come in handy? I don't know. Let's say you're designing a basketball goal, right? And you have your backboard set up. You have your net mount, right, where you hook your net to, but you need the holes from your net to your backboard. Well, yeah, you can do an edit uh, part in the assembly and convert the and all that jazz, but what if you took that and moved it down to your sub-assembly level and then added the holes there where it actually needed to be? So you can actually move things around and, and uh, play with it there, and that's what the envelope publisher is for. Let's go to the CAD mobile. Okay. So here's what we're, we're talking about in assembly. So I, I basically just went ahead and I did this prior to, to um, opening the presentation. I just hit a new uh, form and I created it from a start assembly. Notice these start assemblies are a little different than probably what you guys are seeing at the school on a basic machine. If you've learned about templates. That's a great feature to use build your templates out, make your parts, your assemblies, your drawings, 
give them meaning and value. That way you can use that same template every time and you don't have to recreate the wheel all the time, right? It's also good for consistency. So I went ahead and just created a new assembly. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna use my mouse gesture. Who all uses mouse gestures? You don't know what mouse gestures are, go back to the first presentation this week, watch that video. Mouse gestures are phenomenal. I did a little bit on it. I know Brad touched a little bit on it. Mouse gestures will save you so much time and make you such a more efficient user. You'll be like, why not? I'll give you a snippet of what I explained to the people when I brought up mouse gestures in a presentation before. My son is 18 and he just started a job at a manufacturing facility where they do mold, uh, mold plastics and stuff, right? And so they basically take care of the molds, refurbish the molds and he has the opportunity of working in the office as he's going through college. And he called me up and he's like, dad, man, I've got to do these linear patterns all the time. Why do I have to keep going up to my command manager, dropping the ribbon down and hitting linear pattern? It's taking forever. It's just not taking forever, probably taking what, 20 seconds, but 20 seconds over the course of how many times you do it a day versus how many times you do it a week, that time adds up, right? Adds up a lot. I said, do you know what mouse gestures are? He said, no. I said, find out what they are. So I talked him through it and helped him develop mouse gestures. But just real quick, mouse gestures, basically I'm gonna hold my right mouse button down. I'm gonna drag across, now I can insert a part. I don't have to come up to the top and fool with the command manager. I don't have to travel and make mouse miles, right? Mouse miles is how many times you're moving your mouse around the screen and how much that adds up. So pay attention to that. But mouse gestures and hotkeys. If you don't take anything away from this presentation, mouse gestures and hotkeys, take that away. All right, so I'm just gonna come over here and I'm gonna click on this, this sub-assembly here and it, see how it just kind of populates in there. Um, and I'm just gonna hit check. We'll go ahead and poke the eye. Who knows what poking the eye does? Turns off all that crazy stuff there, right? All your planes, all your coordinate systems, all your origins, all that axes, all that stuff. Gets it where you can turn it back on and, and choose what you want to see too. I just get rid of it for now. So we see right now when I just pulled that in, it's not it, it's showing what you think you're seeing, but it's showing a bunch of installed components, right? It's showing boxes, it's showing bins, it's showing some fenders, um, some HDPE, a bolt bin, a step, right? All that stuff's in here. But how is it located? I mean, is this thing fully defined? I mean, it looks like it's fully defined. Yeah, it's fully defined in this model. One of the stuff in that model is fully defined. Well, it is actually in there. And if we come and expand just this first one, we expand that. What do we see there? You guys remember that little logo from the previous slide? It's an envelope, right? And if we look real close, probably hard to see from way back there from the TV, but it's actually an assembly envelope. So we can actually tell it to show that assembly envelope. That's just the internal installed parts. We can also say show all envelopes. So we can tell it to show all envelopes or hide all envelopes. I think I get to that a little bit later, so getting ahead of myself. But notice there's a body there now. There was envelopes inside of envelopes. Where this can be very beneficial, and we're gonna talk about now a little bit about your supplier, your, um, your customer, whether internal or external. In this case, what we do at Altec is we use this for our internal customer, right? But let's think about a supplier. Let's think about you need to build, these guys, you said you do caps, right? For bottling, capping equipment, okay? Well, let's say you have capping equipment and you have a cap maybe that you have to fit something to, right? Well, that customer sends you the cap in a model form and he says, I need it designed or, or engineered around this cap. Well, you can bring that cap in as an envelope and now that cap doesn't have any effect to your bill of materials or weight of your overall engineered design, right? So in this assembly, if you notice, all I'm cal calculating weight for in my mass is just for everything that's not got that blue kind of translucent color to it, right? If we go to the overall assembly and I'm gonna kind of swap over for you, We look at the mass here, look at the difference. 
in the weight, pounds. We got 2741 pounds, right? 2741 pounds. That's the total weight of this whole thing. If we come back to the assembly we were just looking at that we just created with just the external installed components, and we look at the mass there again, we're only looking at 457 pounds, right? So it's a big difference in how we calculate that. Well, let's say, yeah, anytime a, a customer sends you that, you don't want to calculate for their part, right? Do you need to make their cap? Or if personally, do you need to design their cap and have that cap weight in there? Do you need to buy that cap when you make the equipment? No. So that's where it's helping you. It's, it's excluding the, the weight and it's excluding the, the from the bill of materials. And so you don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, now, as far as how we like to do it um, with what we're doing is we're looking at internal customers. All right, we're looking at the design for manufacturing and how it flows through the shop, right? And so let me come back just to the main assembly and notice we have everything neatly in folders. We talked about that. We definitely want to have design intent. That's also good for just to organize your stuff. I'm sure at some point in your engineering career as a student, some professors gave you a notebook or say, keep a notebook and keep it organized, right? That's always a good principle with it when it comes to engineering. But notice it is also top, level, top down. So when we look at just the body completion, we're looking at the very basics of what it takes to develop this body. Nothing else added, just the body, just the doors, the very basics. So in the processes, as it comes through the shop, they're able to build that portion of it and the guys that need to focus on that can focus only on that, right? And we can look at this when it comes to the print too here in a little bit. But then no, next time it goes, okay, what's the external weld on stuff? Now I've got the body, what extra do I need to weld on, right? And according to your shop process and the flow in your shop, this may be different for you. You may need to be bolting stuff on next instead of welding stuff on next, who knows? Right, so it's all according to how you, you make it flow through the shop and how that, that information is consumed internally. And so it, it allows you to have, that, like I said, each department focusing on what they're doing at that stage in the game. And when you break it up into your prints, you're able to break it up into the prints in the same corresponding um, information. So that first print may just be an overall top level, just looking at it. So it's a pretty picture. We all get those pretty pictures in the instruction manuals, right? From uh, Costco or Walmart or whatever. Um, yeah, so we get those pretty pictures. And that's usually what I go by. I don't know how many of you guys do. I toss the instructions, look at the pretty picture and put it together. <laughs> I don't know. That's just crazy, but I do. Um, but then you get into the next pages of that print and one page is going to be the completion. The next page is going to be the external installed. So that one guy or two guys, many guys it is to develop it, is not seeing a bunch of information that they don't need to see, right? So it just makes sense. So we talked about in, uh, doing the insert and the, the insert and the convert. So we didn't really insert this as, a, as an envelope. So what we can do is we can come back, let's minimize everything that's in here. Anybody know how to quickly minimize this without having to click the plus minus button or the chevrons? Shift C, I like that guy. So shift C, if you're in here, Brad, what'd you do to my shift C? <laughs> <laughs> shift C is supposed to collapse everything. Me and Brad have been sharing this computer all week and we've just been messing with hotkeys and stuff and during presentations and yeah. Shift C will, will collapse everything for you. Or supposed to, but it's not right now. Brad did something, I'm sure. He sabotaged me. Okay, so yeah, any other SolidWorks computer, Shift C will collapse your feature tree. <laughs> Just not mine right now. So we'll, let's say we do need this as a envelope, but we didn't bring it in as an envelope. What do we do? Well, we can right click it, go to the properties of that insertion, that sub assembly. Notice down here at the bottom, it says envelope or ex exclude from bill. Now we could tell it just to exclude from bill, right? That's no big deal. And then of course, when we go to a print, it's not gonna calculate for that on the bill of materials. So when I go ahead and uncheck it, when I check the envelope, 
it automatically excludes it from bill and grays it out. So there's no option of not excluding it from bill. And then when I hit okay, now the whole thing's an envelope. So now everything that's in this model is, of course has no mass. So if I go look at mass now, what do you think is gonna show? Big goose egg, right? Document contains no eligible components for mass. So it's got a big goose egg for its mass. But now I can go in and tie whatever I want to. Let's say I'm making a light mount for this guy, right? So I can just have this and show the light mount only and only worry about that in the bill of materials and my manufacturing process and my weight. Okay, so as far as, let's go ahead and delete it and let's show how to insert it the correct way. So let's say we knew we needed it as a envelope. We can click it here and as we scroll down, we click the envelope button over on the left, bottom left side. And when we insert it now, it will insert as an envelope. Since I just brought my mouse over and clicked it, it landed where, where I put it. Who knows the difference between clicking in the viewing window when you insert a part versus not clicking in the viewing window and just hitting the checkbox. Correct. It, it links itself to the subassembly's origin. So the origins will automatically line up and, and constrain themselves at that point. I'm sorry? It's a plus subassembly. Exactly. Yep. And then if I just drag my mouse into it, it's kind of free floating there. Remember that for the CSWA. Because when you have to include the mass, because when you take the CSWA, you have to give mass. That's how they know if you've got it right. And center of mass is also some of the answers. And if you don't remember how you put things in, and instead of dragging them and clicking in space, instead of just hitting the checkbox, you could have your origins off, and then your center of mass is not going to be right. Remember that for the CSWA. So, yeah, that's the two different ways of bringing the envelope in. You bring it in or you convert it to an envelope, however you please. All right, now we're gonna talk about color and visibility. How do we look at this thing, right? We've seen how I had it set up in the color way I had it set up, but that might not be appropriate for the next man over or lady over, right? It could be that maybe they want purple. I've seen people do neon green and super and you know see-through. So there's a lot of different ways you can look at that. And we'll go to settings and check that out. Also, lightweight and read only. Who deals with large assemblies? Right. What makes it easy? What What does lightweight do for you? Have you used lightweight? It can, especially if you're using a PDM or a PLM system, it can give you headaches there. They are doing much better with it. I'm not sure which PDM or PLM system you're using, but they are doing better with that. Now, I know we used to avoid it like the plague, and over the last couple of years, um, as they've done the upgrades, we're actually using it again. Um, we went from using using it to getting a PLM and then not using it to now we're using it. Who in here knows what a PLM or PDM system is? You PLM is product life cycle management and PDM is product develop data management. Right. Data management. Um, SolidWorks has has that stuff. We use one called Siemens or from Siemens called Team Center. It's a lot of fun. A lot of a lot of fun. <laughs> um, boo. <laughs> I hear the guys in the background throwing popcorn and, and tomatoes from the back, you know. Yeah, so it's, depending on what you need and where you need it um, is going to depend on what kind of PLM or PDM system you guys use. Um, but yeah, you're right. The lightweight has caused issues with some of that stuff. Um, but what is lightweight good for? Speeds up top level assemblies. And what it does in the background, just a little simpli simplification of what it does, right? Is when you load a model, it's rebuilding and it's calculating for e everything in that parametric model, right? It has, to, it has to do all the math and the algorithms and all that stuff in the background and say, okay, here's what I'm showing you. And now I see it on the video, from the video card and I see it on your screen, right? Well, what Lightweight does is says, okay, what is the most simplistic way I can show this without giving them all the information that they may not need, right? And so they give you basically an outside wrap. Let's think of a vinyl wrap versus an actual car inside the, the vinyl wrap, right? So that's basically what the difference it could be. Um, 
I noticed some things with lightweight, for example, if you go to try and dimension or take a measurement from a midpoint of a line, sometimes it won't click there because it doesn't have all that information. So you have to actually solve the lightweight model or part to be able to get, grab that point. Um, but that can be very beneficial. We're gonna look at that as well. Go back to the CAD mobile here. Go up to the settings. So here's in the system options is what we're going to look for. Um, what if you don't know where it's at? This, there's a lot to go through in the system options, isn't it? Anybody ever open a system option and says, dang, where do I start? Okay, I completely understand. Been there, done that, right? Anybody ever looked up here at the search options bar? That is a lifesaver. There's also one called search command. I'll give you a little tip on that one here in just a second, but search command is a huge lifesaver too. So let's go to uh, search uh, options and let's just type in the basics of envelope here, All right? Notice it starts populating as soon as I start typing. So we have system options, we have colors. Maybe that's what we're looking for. We just talked about that, right? Um, we got external references and so on and so forth. So watch what happens when I click on this one automatically drops me into the colors and it shows me kind of where it's at. So when we look at colors, we can scroll down. So we find envelopes. You guys see it before me, let me know. Anyway, it's in here. You click it, you change the color, however you want to look at it there. Um, as you scroll down, you see where it says envelopes here. This is where you set between three different settings. You have semi-transparent, opaque, and do not change. Do not change sounds pretty uh, explanatory, self-explanatory, right? What do you think it does? Makes it look just like a normal model. It's not going to change any colors. It's going to leave it alone. All right, opaque, let's look at that. I'll look at each one of these just so you can see it. Okay, so there's your opaque. And of course, you're semi-transparent, so you can kind of see through it. I like semi-transparent. It not only lets me know it's an envelope, but it also lets me kind of see into it. So if I need to jump in and out of a certain subassembly, I can a little easier that way. Um, then we were looking at yeah, envelope components. There are system options. Of course, we can search for it up here again, but it's under assemblies. You scroll down envelope components. What this allows us to do is every time you load something that has an envelope in it, you can tell it to automatically load in lightweight or read only. All right. So maybe you have an envelope that you don't want to change your envelopes. Maybe it's the customer supplied part. We don't want to modify a customer supplied part, right? So we tell it to. If all our envelopes or customer supply parts are envelopes, maybe we say always load envelopes as read only or lightweight because we know they're going to be monstrous files and we don't want to take forever having to solve for every part or subassembly in that file. Okay, there's those two examples. I'm not going to go back and do this one because you guys seen this when I was trying to show you how the envelopes work, where you could show all envelopes or um, hide all envelopes. You just go to the feature tree, you click right click the envelope, and you can pick either one, whether you want to hide all the envelopes, show all the envelopes at once. Advanced selection is a new tool. I'm not going to go too, de too far in depth with this because advanced selection is a whole nother topic on its own. It's got some if statements. You can do some logic statements. You can say anything inside of this envelope. It, it's got other stuff too. It's got you know configuration names, document names, custom properties. You can do it. You can tell it to do all kinds of logic type statements within the advanced uh, selection, kind of like Excel spreadsheet does, right? When you don't go into advanced searches and stuff in that. 
Um, but with this, you could create an envelope around something and say, if it's inside, then I need this. If it's outside, I need this. If it crosses through, then do this kind of thing. There's a lot of logic in that. Show envelope on drawing. So here's where we're going to go next. We're going to create a drawing. Let's do this guy. So I'm going to create a new drawing. Uh, let's put it on a size four, which is our D drawing. Everybody knows their sheet size is A, B, C, D, right? And what size they are. It's always fun learning. Let's bring in, uh, I'm going to let's try this on. Let's see. I have to save that before I can bring in. Uh, never mind. I'll bring in 74. That'll be fine. Seventy-four will work just fine. Use the F key to fit the screen, right? Or what other thing does it fit the screen for you? It's on your mouse. Click the middle mouse button down twice. So if I hit the middle mouse button twice, see how it fit the screen? Another uh, mouse mile saver, right? Or I don't really talk about mouse mile saver, but last night I talked about my peripheral devices that I use when I work. And not only do I talk about my, saving your mouse miles, but I talk about saving your hand miles, right? And I talk about using macro pads and um touch systems that can you can create logic within and it goes in depth and actually runs uh, programs executables tell it to click on a certain point in a screen type stuff out for you you know there's a lot of stuff into it but think about it make yourself efficient make yourself ergonomic you know because making your job easier is obviously going to make for a much happier employee and more beneficial employer um Let's go ahead and click this, bring it in. All right. Notice what it didn't do. So you kind of see, and it's probably because the uh, tangencies are turned on. We're not going to worry about it, though. So notice it didn't really show everything. It's kind of just showing that main stuff that is not as an envelope. So in order to show an envelope, you, you should simply right-click on it, and you go to the properties of that view and you tell it to show the envelope. And again, this is totally up to you whether you wanna show an envelope or not, um, because again, if you're creating the capping equipment, you may not need to show the cap the, the, the supplier sent you, right? You may just need to show the equipment. And so you could choose whether you wanna see the envelopes or not. You can also choose, and I'm not sure if I'm jumping ahead of myself or not, you can also choose what kind of line weight and what kind of line style is here as well. And you do that within the document properties. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into it. And if I get to it later, then I've already talked about it. Uh, doing the document properties and you go into your, line fonts and styles, yeah. Envelopes and components, right? Notice right now it's kind of set up as a phantom line and it has a different line weight, the thickness, whether it's darker or um, lighter. And so you could change all that there too. We actually, as a company, ran into a big issue with this. Um, just a backstory on it. When we started designing things with envelopes for uh, the shop to consume that information and to go through the manufacturing facility in a certain flowing process, we did everything as envelopes and it worked great. They came out with, I think, 2020 update for SolidWorks. And when we opened all our drawings, everything looked like this with phantom lines. We didn't show them as phantom lines before. We just showed them as regular construction lines with the normal line weight and everything else. So everybody's opening drawings like, what the crap has happened to our drawings? Well, we got into digging and we always do beta testing. Tank and I also uh, do that as well for the company. We'll go out and we'll, before we even release it to the company, we sit down and try and break SolidWorks and all our add-ins that we have with it before we send it out for the rest of the company to use. And that was one of the first things we found was that. And we figured, okay, how are we going to fix it? So I, I figured out how to fix it, got with a uh, another VAR, and they confirmed that my process was correct. 
we went in to actually create, we have, this is all macros. We don't show this too many people. We have all these macros here that we create on this one tab on the envelope view fix in case that thing rears its head anymore. Instead of having to go through the process of fixing it and doing all the steps, we have a macro that just does it all for us, right? Um, what had actually happened is over the course of years, envelopes were always supposed to show us phantom lines and a light weight, right? It never really did, and SolidWorks fixed it in like 2020 version. <laughs> so, so we're trying to complain, hey, it's broke. No, it's not broke. It's just actually working. <laughs> That's always fun to find. So in talking about the envelopes and, and maybe some notes you probably could have jotted down or taken over, this, over the course of this presentation is, is and how to understand references or, or envelopes is that you can use it as a reference. Right, you can use it for product flow within a shop or a manufacturing facility. Noting that it doesn't add mass or items to your bill of material. That's a big win, right? It loads in lightweight or read only. So you don't have to worry about jacking up somebody's uh, product or to load all that information in the background. And also using the selection tool can be very useful if you're trying to do some logic statements and figure some things out there. As Brad said, we like to call people to action and doing things. I always say try at least one thing. Um, we've got presentations. Uh, we've done all, all week so far. We're going to continue to do them tomorrow and the next day. If you link up on Eventbrite, Marty can hook you up with the Eventbrite site. It's all actually on the Meetup site, so it'll link back to it. You're more than welcome to tune into any of the Zoom uh, meetings we have and check out some of those. I know I got an advanced tips and tricks coming up uh, tomorrow. The next day is going to be um, about sheet metal, some kind of more advanced topics of sheet metal. Uh, so feel free to jump on those. The ones we've already done, we have recorded, so we're probably going to publish those at some point in time. Um, but no matter what you do and where you do it, whether it's in a class, whether you learn it here, whether you learn it from Marty, Put one thing into action, right? I know sometimes you walk away and you're done and you're like, man, these guys talked about all this crazy stuff with envelopes and design intent. What a, I don't, I didn't understand half that stuff. But if you can take one nugget away and apply that to your daily workflow, then you will become a better user, right? And the more you practice that one thing, you become a better user and the next time you take another nugget away, right? So it's all about taking nuggets away one at a time. So give it a try, one thing, and I ask, where will you start? And I like to tell people that practice does not make perfect. Practice makes a habit. So as Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but is a habit. So Brad, here's my information. You're more than welcome to reach out and contact me at any point in time. Um, I'm always available for whatever. Um, we share things around, look at things. I have the Western North Carolina um, user group. Brad has a Star City SWUG user group. If you're seeing the ones on Meetup that um, Marty's shared, you can go on Meetup and look for ours as well. Um, I know myself personally, I try and do mine hybrid with people locally and afar. So that way anybody can chime in and see what's going on and what we're doing. So if there's anything that entices you, feel free to join virtually. Um, that is pretty much for mine. Does anybody have any questions about envelopes? It's fine. Mm -mm. Oh. So when you bring it into the assembly, it's just kind of like our PDM looks at it kind of like an ex a suppressed part because it doesn't pull it in as a bill of material as an E-bomb or an M-bomb, right? An engineering bomb or a, or a mechanical bomb. It just pulls it in there and then it has to download it to give it back to you and save it in, but it does not uh, does not calculate it into your bombs or into the equation in your PDM. You can, so so for example, when I'm, I'm using my workflow here, uh, yeah, SolidWorks, let's come back to 70. So for example, when I'm using this workflow, I'll keep all my checked out work on it and when I save it in, save it all in and check it in at the same time. But that's because I'm, I'm modifying all levels of those envelopes, right? Now, if you're using it, for example, as a cap, right, and it's a customer supplied part, you just always leave it checked in. Nobody will ever be able to modify it anyway. 
it'll just always pull down and go up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, except for except for it doesn't apply to your bill of materials, your e bomb or m bomb or anything. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because I know some PDM files, especially with configurations, it'll it'll turn like flat flat patterns, for example, in sheet metal. If you don't have it referenced as a flat pattern, it could create it as another part number in your PDM, right? When you try and save it in. Um, so yeah, it doesn't do anything like that. Yeah. Create STL files and yeah, I mean, the envelopes just basically gonna set it to a type of. Uh, it doesn't mess with the part file or the model at all. It's only classifying it once it's in the assembly. So in the part file, it stays the same. It's it's when you when you insert it into your assembly is when you um, select. Yeah. And 3D interconnect and 3D interconnect and stuff with SolidWorks is also getting a lot better. I know when you bring in STL files a couple of years ago, good luck. <laughs> you know, it's in there. However you scanned it, it's going to be laying whatever cattywonk way you scanned it. Um, and trying to click on the surface, you're going to click everything or the point in cloud. Good luck modifying it, cutting it, doing anything you need to to have any kind of control over it at some point. But now they actually came along where they're noticing a lot more people are using these handheld 3D scanners or laser uh, scanners, and and so SolidWorks is jumping on board with it. Geomagic's great, yeah. What kind of scanner do you use? Spider, yeah, that's awesome. Yep, um, we had so at the college we we have the spider and we have the um, the iron looking one. I forgot the name of it. Huh? Eva. Leo or Eva? Eva. Yep. Yeah, if you're doing smaller intricate parts, anything smaller than a basketball, you want the spider for sure. Well, or a wine bottle typically bottles are a little bit yeah, once you bring it in, you clean it up, and you fill any kind of surfaces you got going on, whatever. I mean, if you want to use it in your assembly, yeah, at, bring it in and use it as a as an envelope. Of course, STLs are kind of dumb models anyway; they don't really have much to them. They're basically just unless you water, make them watertight and fill them. You're watertight and fill them, so then then you might wind up putting some mass on it at that point. Of course. I know one employer, what we'd do is we'd say, okay, what does it actually weigh? And then we'd actually reverse the calculation to get what the, the mass should be. And we didn't put that in for that material. So what it really should be is mass is different than what we would put it in as. But you wouldn't worry about it if you save it in as a part and then you pull it in as an envelope because then it doesn't affect anything. Yep. Any other questions about envelopes or anything in general? They do, as long as you rebuild them. So you can set, you can set SolidWorks to rebuild every time you move back and forth and you can tell it not to. Um, it depends on your workflow. If, you've, if you're always having people update and change things, maybe you don't want to rebuild until you tell it to rebuild because then you're always coming back and you're sitting there waiting, let's go get coffee, you know, while I'm waiting for my computer to reload. If you're working on a big, big level, top level assembly. Um, but yeah, as long as you rebuild, I mean, it's always going to see that. Yeah. That's a good question as well. One more thing I did promise to show you guys. Um, I'll just come back. Let me use a, a smaller command manager here. All right, we'll use markups. So I did mention, you know, command manager and how great it is. Um, if we come in here and we say cut, for example, right, and we know we want to cut something, it automatically filters that down. Just make sure it's in command. You can click on this, and it'll actually go ahead and perform that action for you. But if you hit the eyeball, does anybody know what that does? It'll show you exactly where it lives. So the next time you go to do it, you know where it's at, right? Even gonna. Press W on your keyboard, it automatically jumps here. 
too. Yeah. So don't read from where, then type in like mass copy or whatever. I, I have such an embarrassing thing. Have you used AutoCAD a lot in the past? Yes. Yeah. AutoCAD heads are, are our typers all day long. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Been there and know what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you, here's another good example of this. So we just said, okay, we want to find out where a cut is. We don't want to activate it. We are we don't really care where it's at. Let me hold on one second. I've got to probably unlock this real quick before I can do it. All right, I've already got it unlocked from a previous session. So we go in here and not only do we want to activate it or see where it's at, but we can actually drag it off. Don't be mean. We can actually drag it off and apply it to a command ribbon. It is not going to be nice, is it? So I put it there and didn't want to put it there. Come on. I know it's always when you do something live. Let's uh, pretty sure I can get it to work here. Cut extrude, drag it off, and there you go. Now I've applied it to the command. And what makes that cool is if you create a whole new tab, you can create a new tab, name it my tab, and just fill it with all your stuff that you want to use. And then you got a tab that's yours. So and if you have something on there you want to get rid of, just go to customize, grab it, and drag it off. So yeah, I promised I'd show that earlier. Any other questions? Any tips or tricks you want to know about? Any Call me like my son did and ask me how to do something later. That's cool too. <laughs> that works. <laughs>